it, what do I want to see out of this? I want that process to be brought to light. Tonight, we hear from the lawyer representing the First Nations woman in a violent surveillance video gone viral. What do we do when our shelter is full and people come to the door? And trying to tackle homelessness in Yellowknife. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The federal government says it supports an investigation into water plant upgrades at Nishkandiga First Nation in Northern Ontario. This after almost the entire community has been evacuated to Thunder Bay. Creek community some 430 kilometers northeast of Thunder Bay was the poster child for water woes on First Nations having been on a boil water advisory for 25 years and counting. The federal Liberals promised to address the long-term boil water advisories, but later admitted their ambitious plan wouldn't be fulfilled by 2021. Nishkantiga says their water plant has been a disaster from the get-go, and Ottawa needs to stop throwing money at it for headlines and get to the root of design and work flaws. The reason why I requested it is, uh, you know, this has been uh, ongoing for 25 years, which is, you know, somebody would question that themselves, you know. You don't need a rocket scientist to... Uh, question why why it's going that why why it has been going that way and you know it's just uh you know something that uh, we we have had questions with you know going from uh 8.8 8 million dollar uh, project to a 16.5 million dollar project while my uh, community members are being uh used as uh pawns and you know you know it's being a volleyball or whatever being just being played with. The owner of Kingdom Construction, which was kicked off Nishkantiga by the band just weeks before the water upgrades were to be complete, told APTN any design or construction problems could have been addressed and believes the band erred in its handling of the situation. Why do I think they want to investigate anything blah blah blah? I don't know. Probably because uh, they want to make it seem like for political reasons that something serious is going on and they got to run over and fix it or got to do or something like that. I don't know. Did you It doesn't uh, take a brain surgeon. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out what's wrong. It's yeah. just that it's it, I think it's a distraction myself. I I really do. I think it's not getting to the key problem but I'm not going to identify what I believe to be the key problem other than the fact that there's politics involved. Mi'kmaq community is launching lawsuits after a month of violence, as well as what they see as a lack of RCMP response and a lack of protection from the Department of Fisheries. Here's Angel Moore with more. Hello Winnipeg, I'm here in Sebaganagati First Nation where Chief Mike Sachs says community members are reeling from the violence over the recent moderate livelihood fisheries. Sachs says it doesn't help matters that the RCMP are not charging the people accused of harassing, assaulting and damaging the property of community members. I couldn't believe it when I was told that, that they actually said that they had bigger cases to worry about. And for me, a, a burning van is not bigger than a assault on one of our Mi'kmaq women. Um, that just speaks volumes. Over a month ago, Sebag and Nagati First Nation launched their moderate livelihood fishery, exercising their treaty right to fish. That was met with violence from non-Indigenous fishers who say the lobster stock is at risk. Lawyers are gathering evidence from Sebag and Nagati community members and are preparing lawsuits. We've all seen in the last number of years all across Canada that you know First Nations people have just been pushed aside and those cases are just uh, left on a desk until everybody forgets about it and that's that's not going to happen here like they're going to be held accountable one way or another. Sebag and Nagati Moderate Livelihood Management Plan says since the Mi'kmaq are semi-nomadic the plan covers the traditional terry of Mi'kma'ki which includes a, which includes the province of Nova Scotia. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Sebag and Nagati, First Nation. To pandemic news now. Nunavut held on to having no cases of COVID-19 for almost eight months. And now the territory has three active cases, the newest case in Rankin Inlet. Rankin Inlet has a population of just over 2,800 people and is the hub for Nunavut's Kivalek region. The other community with active cases, Santa Kilowak with two, 
Both of those communities are in stage four lockdown, the highest stage in Nunavut's plan. Schools and offices are closed. Stores are on reduced hours with masks mandatory to shop. Since Rankin is a hub, neighboring communities in Iqaluit have been raised to stage two. Nunavut's new health minister is from Rankin Inlet and had some advice for the people at home. Please stop guessing about who, what, where, when and how this happened. Let's focus more on what we need to do to stop the spread. Let's use common sense and follow the public health measures, limit visiting, wear a mask. Manitoba has seen over 2,500 cases of COVID-19 in the past week and more than 20 deaths in the last three days alone. Today, the province announced 474 new cases of the virus and nine more deaths, equaling yesterday's record. With these staggering numbers, the entire province is critical level red zone. First Nations in the province have also been hit hard. As of Wednesday, there are 6,030 active cases of COVID-19 in Manitoba. 1,086 of them are among First Nations people. 510 of those cases are on reserve. 567 are off res 576 are off reserve. Manitoba's top doctor says the code red lockdowns are necessary. Our hospitals are nearing capacity. And so we need to ensure we're stepping up now to reduce our contacts. We don't need distractions now. Distractions are harmful to Manitobans. The message is clear. Stay home. Only socialize within your household. We're going to step aside for a quick break, but still to come, a complaint made against community safety officers in a northern Manitoba city. She can't be the first person that filed an RCP complaint and has been pressured into withdrawing these complaints. Welcome back. A disturbing surveillance video from 2018 was made public this week. It shows a First Nations woman being knocked unconscious by a community safety officer in the northern city of Thompson, Manitoba. It's prompting calls for an investigation. Brittany Hobson has more and a note for our viewers. The video may be disturbing for some. This security footage from two years ago has Indigenous leaders across Canada condemning violence against Indigenous women at the hands of officers. On January 8, 2018, community safety officers in Thompson, Manitoba, arrested Janesta Garson for suspicion of public intoxication. When the then 19-year-old First Nations woman was brought to RCMP headquarters, she was told to take off some of her clothing. The video shows Garson remove her belt and she throws it toward the officers. It then shows one of the officers knock Garson to the ground, where she lays unconscious. Officers then drag Garson into a cell. Rohit Gupta, Garson's lawyer, says there is no excuse for the level of force used. Regardless of what anyone says, well, she threw a belt at an officer, the proportionate response like, for an individual, especially a peace officer, is guided by the criminal code. And the criminal code states when an individual can defend themselves. Uh, this is not self-defense. Garson was later transported to hospital. She was charged with assaulting a peace officer, but that charge was stayed. Garson and Gupta filed a former complaint against RCMP, but Gupta says officers came to Garson's home asking her to drop the complaint. She can't be the first person that filed an RCMP complaint and has been pressured into withdrawing these complaints. Uh, Again, to even go to that level where we file a complaint you know, and to have no resolution of this and have RCMP officers investigating themselves, I, I think that, what do I want to see out of this? I want that process to be brought to light. In January, Garson filed a lawsuit against the RCMP, the City of Thompson, the Attorney General of Canada, and then two community safety officers. When we don't have the checks and balances in place, 
we again have these rogue cowboy officers running around the north playing cops and robbers. Gupta says this incident highlights the need to examine the Intoxicated Persons Attention Act. This, this week, time, Assistant Commissioner and Commanding Officer of the Manitoba RCMP, Jane McClatchy, released a statement acknowledging there are issues with the act. We all know a detachment cell block is not the best place to house someone who is intoxicated. However, sometimes there is little other choice. I can assure you that our senior officers are working with the province and partners across the sectors to find solutions that do not involve arresting individuals and placing them in our cells. Meanwhile, regional chiefs from BC and Quebec and Labrador have called for an independent investigation. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Quebec says they're on board with the campaign to have Louis Riel exonerated in time for the 135th anniversary of his execution. A motion calling for an official pardon from Canada was passed unanimously in the National Assembly earlier this week, but the Métis National Council says they don't want it to happen. Alexandre Leduc of the Quebec Solidaire Party presented the motion on Wednesday, calling for a commemoration day on November 16th and for Canada to declare Riel innocent. A coalition of Métis and non-Métis leaders brought together by a Montreal City Councillor made the first calls last week. Métis National Council Vice President David Chartrand says the move was poorly considered. You hear a couple of people claim to be Métis leaders and you jump behind it and say, oh, this is what the voice of the West is coming in? The Riel family spoke against this and they still stand against it. And they stand against any exoneration of pardon of Riel. So you ask the people that are truly going to be the, the individuals and the citizens and the nation that's going to be affected, their view before you move on a, on a matter and telling the country of Canada, because we will fight the country of Canada if they at any time try to wipe their hands of this history. To Saskatchewan now, where there's also been a dramatic rise in COVID-19 cases and some communities are now on lockdown. Our Saskatoon reporter Priscilla Wolf has an update on COVID-19, how it's currently affecting the province. Thanks, Winnipeg. Today, the province reported 111 new cases of COVID-19, making the provincial total 4,437. The community of Big River First Nation, 120 kilometers northwest of Prince Albert, is currently in lockdown to get the situation under control. According to several Facebook posts on the Big River First Nation Health Center page, on November 10th, they reportedly had 82 active cases of COVID-19. The community has a population of 2,600 people. That means 3% of the population is infected with COVID-19, making it one of the highest COVID-19 rates in Saskatchewan. On October 30th, the community of Big River First Nation went into total lockdown, allowing people on and off the reserve only for medical needs and groceries. And they have a daily curfew from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. daily with on-site testing for COVID-19. Also happening in Saskatchewan, a group of Saskatchewan doctors and nurses wrote an open letter to Premier Scott Moe this week over rising concerns of COVID-19 cases in the province. The letter states, we know that our hospitals are already full. We know that our ICUs are already full. And so I think the time to act is now because actions that we do now are still going to take us probably two weeks to start making impact. To date, Saskatchewan has 29 COVID-19 deaths. Back to you in Winnipeg. And Alberta also announcing new restrictions today. Time for one more quick break, but still to come, a state of emergency in Yellowknife. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This stunning photo was taken by Kara Schneider Ross and it's of the Lac La Grande region in Saskatchewan. An amazing scene of the skyline and light from a rising sun captures some of the beauty of Saskatchewan. 
Amazing colors there. Well, we'd like to see more photos from you. You can send yours to share at aptn.ca. And maybe your photo will be our photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 6 and cloudy for St. John's, 9 in Halifax. Minus 9 for Kujuak, 3 below with snow in Nain. Plus 8 with showers for Montreal, 5 above for Shibugamu in Saguenay. Plus 9 with rain in Toronto, plus 2 with snow for Sault Ste. Marie. Minus 2 under sunny skies in Thunder Bay, 3 below with snow in Sioux Lookout. Minus 13 in Churchill, 5 below in God's Lake. Minus 1 under sunny skies for Winnipeg and Dauphin, 0 in Brandon. 0 for Regina and Yorkton, minus 2 in Saskatoon. Minus 5 in Uranium City and Buffalo Narrows. Over to northern Alberta, 10 below in high level, 0 for Grand Prairie. Plus 2 in Medicine Hat, plus 1 in Edmonton and Calgary. 8 above with showers for Vancouver, plus 10 with rain in Victoria. Minus 5 and snow in Dease Lake, plus 1 with snow for Smithers. 13 below in Old Crow, minus 5 and flurries in Whitehorse. Snow in 15 below in Yellowknife, snow, minus 18 in Norman Wells. Minus 19 with snow for Saks Harbor, flurries in 11 below in Pulatuck. Minus 12 and snow in Whale Cove and Baker Lake. Minus 23 in Resolute, 20 below with snow in Joe Haven. Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities share a 400-year history and a similar fight for social justice and one that has ramped up in 2020. Here's a preview of this week's episode of APTN Investigates, Racism Lives Here Too, Part 2. Injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. History repeats itself because the present hasn't listened. Black lives matter. Indigenous lives are sacred. A lot of the time, the same thing that both Native people and Black people are fighting for, the, the end goal is the exact same thing. Both the Black Loyalists and the Mi'kmaq, being outsiders to British society, would form a bond that would last all the way until present day. The histories of Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities have intertwined for over 400 years. But there are tensions around the politics of identity. I always used the term, I was too black to be native and too native to be black. So you kind of fell in between. The, the system's still attacking all, both groups of people. We're both still marginalized and facing the white supremacy. When you're a person of color, we have a saying here that you know, Nova Scotia is the, the deep south of Canada. And when Mi'kmaq assert treaty rights, racism rears its head. This is our, our rights, our treaty rights! You will work a day in your life. Imagine them. They need it. It was heartbreaking at first to be looking at videos and being like, Man, like I walked a graduation stage with some of you guys. And you can watch the conclusion to Racism Lives Here Too. That airs tomorrow night, right after the newscast on APTN Investigates. And if you'd like to see part one, you can head over to our website, aptnnews.ca. Now to give us a look ahead to what's coming up on Nation to Nation tonight, right after the news, here's host Todd Lamorand. Hello, I'm Todd Lamorand, and here's who we'll have on Nation to Nation tonight. He's well known to viewers of APTN National News, and is often an outspoken critic of the federal government. He's Senator Murray Sinclair, and he'll be talking about the response to COVID on reserve and the lobster dispute in Nova Scotia. As well, earlier today, the 60 Scoop Healy Foundation had an opening ceremony and unveiled their permanent board members. Wayne Garners-Williams is a Scoop survivor and on that board, so he'll talk about that. 
and his expectations from President-elect Joe Biden and his cabinet. That's coming up shortly after the national news. You catch Todd in uh, about five minutes' time. Those experiencing homelessness in Yellowknife are facing even harder times this year with the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of safe distancing, they have fewer places to go. Advocates have been speaking out on what they think should be done, but whether they've had a real say in what happens is up for debate. Here's this story from Charlotte Moore Jacobs. It's a routine occurrence at the sobering center day shelter in Yellowknife. APTN News was told a fight broke out after threats of a stabbing. But that's just what goes on inside the center. Nowadays, many stay on the streets all day, nowhere to go as the space has drastically reduced capacity. A second temporary day shelter opened last Friday, but it took the territorial government declaring a state of emergency on homelessness to make it happen. The city of Yellowknife had rejected using the building for a shelter back in August. Nisha Rao and Nick Sousan both work with vulnerable clients and believe the city's decision was breached unfairly. It was really just the opinions of a couple of landlords and businesses that were operating nearby and they sent in letters and they were consulting the wire public. Uh, you know, there wasn't a discussion in the wire public. Uh, at least not at city council, mm -hmm. and there wasn't, uh, you know, the people who would be using the service. There was no discussion with them. There was no discussion with the, uh, you know, the people who work uh, in in, shelter, in day shelters. In September, the two created a public advocacy group. It was well received, and their voice was carried into government. And it was really great to see so many people uh, express their support for there being a shelter this winter. But the work is far from over. Here's the new shelter already reaching capacity. Every day, the Salvation Army Emergency Shelter in Yellowknife sets up overflow beds. COVID-19 physical distancing health measures reduce their capacity too. Our biggest concern over the, the COVID period has been, what do we do when our shelter is full and people come to the door? Jason Brinson says during the pandemic, there's an increased need for coordinating services available for those experiencing homelessness. There are services that are available. It's access to them. I, I can remember one person in particular that, you know, that we helped. One of his biggest concerns was the paperwork. It was a very stressful uh, part of his journey for whatever reason. And, uh, and so just pointing them in the right direction of where to find that support. There's no expiry date for the new temporary shelter, but then again, no expiry date on when issues around homelessness will be resolved. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. Unfortunately, a similar story in every city in this country. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. You can find more on these and other stories over on our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Stick around. Todd Lamarand is up next with Nation to Nation. We'll see you back here tomorrow.